So picture that you are seeing a nine-year-old child who has been having attentional difficulties in school, a lot of restlessness, uh, behavior problems, uh, declining grades. And um, same thing is happening at home. And um, obviously you're thinking, you know, ADHD. But then you think of all the adult patients you saw who told you that they were diagnosed with ADHD within a year of being uh, molested by someone in their families or any other history of trauma. Because, you know, if you think about it, it's not that far-fetched to imagine that a traumatized child would start having behavioral problems in school or attentional problems or declining grades and, you know, start fighting and have more irritability at home, for example. And then you ask yourself, boy, it wouldn't be amazing if we had a test to tell the difference, you know, and we don't have to go uh, as far as discussing the ethical implications of prescribing stimulants for someone to a child who is uh, being victim of abuse, um, considering what stimulants do when it comes to uh, uh, compliance, so to speak, right? Kind of increases your... Uh, the control of your, um, increases the influence of verbal commands on, on your behavior. But uh, we, we don't have to go there. We can just stop there and, and, and ask, well, will that ever happen? Will we ever have a lab that will answer that question? And, um, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to share some, the complexities of that question. And I want to share the complexity of the thought that we can actually find biomarkers for our psychiatric syndromes. By sharing that, I don't believe we can, and I don't believe we'll ever find anything. Um, and and this is a, an important important topic because for a few reasons. One is because um, there's a confusion between biomarker and causation they're not the same thing and that's one thing the, the complexity of that relation i'm going to try to explore and and you can you know see if it helps you uh entertain the difficulty that we face in that regard the other thing is that matters because for as long as we're chasing this concept of uh, a biological marker for psychiatric disorders we may be just may be reinforcing the same paradigm of training that we have been practicing for the past decades and that got us where we are, which is not a good place to be. Um, so the other thing before I continue is to say, I hope you entertain how difficult it is, this discussion, because I am trying to explain why something isn't. In science, we have the concept of null hypothesis, meaning nothing has any relationship until proven otherwise. So take, for example, SSRIs have nothing to do with depression. They don't change depression. There's no relationship. And that is what we call the null hypothesis. The role of research is to refute the null hypothesis and say, well, listen, SSRIs actually do improve mood, right? Now, we have so much misinformation or the serotonin thing, right? Have to prove that serotonin has nothing to do with depression. Low serotonin is not the cause of depression or it's not associated even in a process way with uh, depression. Having to prove that something isn't shouldn't be a task because we have to prove the things that are in science, right? But there's so much misinformation in psychiatry, so much that we find ourselves having to prove that something isn't, as opposed to say, okay, let's put our energy in proving that something is. Um, but let's go. I'm going to read a definition of uh, biomarker from the World Health Organization. It says that is any substance, structure, or process 
that can be measured in the body or its products and influence or predict the incidence of outcome or disease. That's a fair definition of, uh, it's not a simple one, of um, a biomarker. So I'll start by saying that we're not going to have any biomarker that will work as a proof of a brain disease. We're not going to have a biomarker that says, okay, the presence of this biomarker proves that, for example, depression is a brain disease. All right. And um, let's go with that. So um, you guys may have heard, heard my previous arguments of running from a bear, right? You see a bear and for no good reason, because you cannot outrun the bear, but you decide to run away from the bear. Why are you running from the bear? Where is the cause of that behavior? Is the cause of the behavior the bear? Is the cause of the behavior your brain or in your brain? Or is the cause of running in your leg muscles? Or is the cause of the behavior your eyes that were able to see the bear? So your brain will have a given process when it comes to see a bear and then start running, okay? Now, that process in your brain could possibly be observed if you were all wired or, you know, inside of an MRI, a functional MRI or something. Um, but is that the cause of the running? And there's no way you can make an argument to say that the process in the brain is the cause of the behavior. There's no way that you can separate your behavior from the environment where it happens. Because any of the elements that you remove, if I chop your legs, if I remove your eyes, if I lobotomize you, or if I get rid of the bear, there'll be no running. So the cause of the behavior is necessarily in the relationship with the environment. I'll give you another example. If you and I are walking on the streets and someone yells, Rod! I am the only one that will look to find who called me. You pr probably wouldn't. You could. It's a bit weird, though. So what am I trying to say? That I have a history of uh, responding to Rod that was I learned through my contingencies, and you don't. Why does that matter? Well... Uh, I'm going to quote Skinner here. So Skinner uh, pointed out that every every change in behavior is learning. All right? So that's how he referred to it. Every change is learning. Learning and behaving virtually synonyms. Um, and he said that accumulation of knowledge was a metaphor. Meaning, if we were accumulating something in the brain, our brains will have an increasing volume. Simple as that. And if anything, if anything is the opposite, you know, after you turn 35, 30 to 35, it doesn't matter. You can learn a little language. You can learn how to play a, a tuba. It doesn't matter. Your brain will shrink. It doesn't matter how much more you learn after that time in your life. Your brain will actually be losing volume. So the solution for that puzzle, Skinner came up with, okay, the brain is changing, okay? The brain's changing. And we know how the brain changes, right? This guy said this thing in 53. But we know how the brain changes. It changes in the sense that here and there, every so often, there are new connections that are made. But for the most part, um, each neuron has like something like 6,000 connections. And the changes are strengthening or weakening of those connections through specific circuits. That's as much as we know. Now, Skinner in 53 said the brain changes to respond in this new different way in a similar circumstance. There is no accumulation of knowledge. Considering that, um, two thoughts. One is the word neurodivergent means absolutely nothing. Second one is that... Um, my brain changed to respond to Rod. Yours didn't. 
I have a relationship with that word, with that name, if you will. Is there a molecule for rod in my brain? Can you dissect my brain and find the rod molecule? Can you find my brain and find the running away from the bear molecule? You cannot. Why? Because those changes that you can measure, you can actually see my brain responding to the word rod if we have the proper set of uh, equipment. Um, and I would not be able to lie that my name is not rod in that sense if they're watching my brain. And it's fair to assume that there's enough similarity between my brain responding to rod and your brain responding to your name. Okay? So let's say responding to a name has a fair amount of similarity. Okay, fair amount of similarity. But that is measuring the process of responding to my name. In other words, learning or in that sense the, the process of responding to the name are functional changes in the brain but not structural changes in the brain. And if they're not structural in the sense that they don't generate measurable changes. So there is no molecule for rod and there's no change in my brain that could, you cannot dissect my brain and find the name rod inside of it and will never be able to do so. If you believe so, maybe in 500 years, oh God knows, right? But we only have functional changes in that regard. Then you can say, well, but can't we use the processes? Before we even move to genes, right? Can't the processes in the brain be used as a biomarker? Well, in those two cases, it will be useless because I already see you running away from the bear. You already told me I ran away from the bear. And now you're no longer running. The process is over. And uh, my responding to Rod is also observable. So really doesn't add knowing that there is a brain process uh, behind it. It's the same as saying I'm driving a car holding the wheel with my left hand. Well, there's a brain process mediating that that is different if I was holding with the right hand. There's a brain process mediating that. Other side of the brain, all kinds of things. But I cannot look to a brain of a person inside of a car without looking to the behavior of the person inside of a car and tell with what hand he's holding the wheel. Because he could be driving, a silly example, a Tesla holding a cup with the right hand, a Tesla that drives itself. Similarly, can we use processes um, to diagnose some of our syndromes? The answer is no. And two arguments. One is well, let's stick to the simple one. Let's stick to the simple one. Let's say attention and restlessness, like the example I gave in the beginning of the our chat, right? So let's say can we use the impairment in a can the Inability to focus, does that have a process in the brain? Let's assume it does. And the restlessness, does that have a process in the brain? Let's assume it does. So now we have restlessness process in the brain and inattention process in the brain. What are we going to attribute that to? You may be thinking uh, uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity syndrome. I am thinking of generalized anxiety syndrome because I also have in generalized anxiety, uh, hyper, uh, psychomotor ag agitation, and I have impairment in uh, ability to focus. Or you could be thinking of generalized anxiety syndrome, but I'm thinking of major depressive syndrome that also has psychomotor agitation and inability to focus again. So now we're looking to a problem with our syndromic diagnosis. Can we see the process? We possibly could. We put possibly could. But what are we going to attribute that to? Should we assume that, and you, you must have heard that when that was pointed out in the past, researchers of ADHD said, well, you know, PTSD changes the brain to make it look like ADHD. 
anything that makes us give uh, medications at, at the end of the day, right? Um, but think of a computer, right? If you're using a um, text editor or if you're using a spreadsheet or if you're using um, um, uh, uh, the video game to uh, the, uh, the computer to play a video game, the structure of the computer is not changing. All those changes are functional. Those are things the the brain can do. Those are things the computer can do. Those are things the brain can do: run from a bear, respond to your name, or be uh, restless, or uh, be unable to focus. Those capacities the brain already has. And it shouldn't generate any major changes that could be used uh, as a biomarker that are any better at the very minimum than looking to the person and saying, what's up? And the person saying, well, I can't focus or I can't uh, sit still or I'm feeling sad for so long or I felt very afraid and I ran from the bear. It doesn't really tell you where this thing is going. It doesn't tell the difference between syndromes either. Then you're going to say, well, we still have the genes. Can we have a gene for a given syndrome or a group of genes? And again, the answer is probably not, given the complexity of the task. I don't think we will ever have it. And I'll explain my reasoning. And, you know, you feel free to uh, open my eyes. I always, I, I really appreciate the emails I get. Info at nepmi.org and open my eyes, okay? Um, so how can we look at genes? So for once is, are genes, can we blame genes as the causation of psychiatric syndromes? And apparently we cannot because we already have, for example, for schizophrenia syndrome, uh, monozygotic twins, they have a, uh, if one twin meets criteria for schizophrenia, chances are slightly above 50% that the other one will do it. Slightly above 50%. So now we have something like 48 or 49 or even 45% of monozygotic twins of schizophrenic folks that don't meet criteria for schizophrenia. And we'll go about life and we'll die without it. So now we cannot, can no longer blame the genes for that as the causation factor. Oh, but it's more complex than that. Okay, so let's think about this. Can we understand genes as something that confers the capability of having a symptom? First example of major depressive disorder. Feeling sad for a whole month. Is, could that be determined by the presence of a gene? I would say it could. We all have it, though, because we all can feel sad for a month. Okay, and we're going to talk about the whole package, the syndrome, in a second. So um, probably no, right? Because given the right circumstances, anyone can feel sad for a month. And if you take that, or two weeks, or whatever is the criteria for, for DSM, for the major depressive syndrome, um, how about hearing voices? Can we attribute the capability of hearing voices to a gene? Let's assume we could. Let's assume we found a gene that confers you the capability of hearing voices, like gene per symptom, one gene per symptom. Perfect. To what are we going to attribute that gene? Are we going to attribute the gene to the schizophrenia syndrome? Or are we going to attribute the gene to major depressive syndrome with psychotic features? Or we're going to attribute the gene to mania? with psychosis or to a personality disorder that may have auditory hallucinations. Even PTSD, even though, even though it's not syndromic, we all know that people with PTSD can uh, develop auditory hallucinations. Will that marker have any use 
for us? Will that really work as a biomarker? Well, can we have a gene? Why can't we have a gene for the whole presentation, for the whole syndrome? The so, uh, let's call, desired and um, dreamed um, entity behind the syndrome, right? Because, you see, we were trained erroneously, uh, fallaciously, to believe that the syndromic presentation is a representation of an underlying thing, right? So that underlying thing, that entity, that biological entity, the gene that determines that biological entity, and that biological entity will then manifest as this given syndrome. And again, my answer for that is we're not going to find it. I don't think it's possible, and I'll explain that with, with mania, okay? So I'm going to read to you two sets of symptoms that are completely different, that will give you completely different presentations and, um, um, or phenotypes, if you will. Um, but they both would meet criteria for mania. So you can have someone who's elated, not sleeping, displaying a lot of goal-directed activity with involvement in activities with high potential for painful consequences. That will meet criteria for mania. And then we also have someone who's very irritable, grandiose, with pressure speech, distractible, and with flight of ideas. That also meets criteria for mania. But there are two completely different presentations. If your claim or hopes, or our claim or hopes, that there's one single determinant for those two completely different presentations is real, it's also fair to expect that that one single determinant would also present something like hearing voices and negative symptoms and meet criteria instead for schizophrenia. Because if this one entity can manifest as these two completely different things, what's to say that this one entity cannot manifest as this other completely different thing? And guess what? That's where we are right now. We have 22 candidate genes for mania, and they are shared. The same two candidate genes are shared with schizophrenia. If it wasn't sufficient, we have a lot of uh, family history of schizophrenia associated with attention deficit hyperactivity syndrome and with mania or bipolar syndrome. So at the end of the day, we are looking to what? It seems that we're looking to a bunch of genes that somehow confer to you the capability of doing whatever you want when it comes to our psychiatric syndromes. Besides that, I already mentioned the argument of the monozygotic twins. Even with all those genes sitting there, nothing happens in slightly less than 50% of the monozygotic twins. Nothing happens. They're fine. They're fine. Oh, they're a bit weird. Whatever. They're not meeting criteria. Now, we have to look, obviously, to our limitations with our syndromes. Let's assume we find one day a gene that is associated with the, you know, this putative entity of schizophrenia, right? And if you have worked as much as a week in your life, you know that there are not two, schizoph two patients that meet criteria for schizophrenia that are the same. But let's assume we found the entity behind schizophrenia. Let's assume that is possible. Let's, let's assume those, because so far the evidence we have is that the changes are functional. And we have enough data to know also that a lot of people just get better. But let's assume for a second there's a biological entity behind the syndrome of schizophrenia common to all people that meet criteria for schizophrenia. Now, you can only meet criteria for schizophrenia once you turn six months. That will mean, because we have the concept of spectrum and all the expansion of diagnosis that came from it, obviously from commercial financial interests, as we saw with the diagnosis of bipolar, 
one tenth of American population has the diagnosis are, are walking around with the diagnosis of bipolar uh, syndrome now. One tenth, one tenth people. And um, just as a small note, I'm working on a, an episode of why I explain why why I don't talk politics in my podcast, and I also ask that from all my interviewees. And um, we're having a very interesting. Um, it seems we're having a very interesting conflict of uh, between financial interests that will unfortunately uh, influence psychiatry again. But um, I'm going to talk about that in a, in, a, in an upcoming episode. If you have schizophrenia, schizophrenia form disorder, then, and your symptoms resolve by four months, you should not have that marker that is common to the entity of schizophrenia. And if you have had brief psychotic disorder, you should not have that marker. If you have felt sad and had no appetite and couldn't focus because your puppy died or because someone important to you died, you should not have the marker of the entity of depression. So, so far, and this is important to be said, we have no biomarkers. Okay, Google, watch it, go to PubMed. We have no biomarkers, all right? We have no evidence of brain disease. We have, however, a lot of evidence for uh, functional changes in the brain, not necessarily structural changes, but functional changes. And we also have some uh, evidence, maybe some small evidence in favor of, let's assume we have evidence in favor of structural differences, which is hard to buy into considering that all our brains change in different directions over different factors. But those changes and those genes also don't confer, don't give us an answer. Like, for example, with the twins with uh, that meet criteria for schizophrenia. So that is the complexity of what we are chasing when it comes to biomarkers. Now, it's a complex topic, and I've been working on this for many months, and this is, I cannot even tell you the number of the attempt to record this damn thing because of the, the complexity of the ideas involved and because I'm trying to prove that something isn't. So those two things together made this uh, conversation very difficult for me. And it's possible that I missed something. It's possible that I didn't cover something or some angle. So, you know, I hope it was stimulating to you to listen to this. And if there are angles that I have missed that were really not covered by this rationale, that pretty much was just an attempt to show the absurdity of the idea. Um, but I may be wrong. I uh, hope, you know, one day I may be proven wrong. If I'm missing something, please, info at nepmi.org.com. No. Dot org info at nepmi.org uh, thank you for listening and if you found this interesting uh, subscribe and share